for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, by Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This tape is two services with Derek Prince at the Tennessee, Georgia CFO camp, Eatonton, Georgia. The first service is a youth meeting. The second service is a children's deliverance service. And the youth meeting is Wednesday afternoon, August the 25th. The children's meeting is Thursday evening, August the 26th, 1971. Now, this is an unscheduled meeting, and I've come here this afternoon just trusting that the Lord will give me a message and teaching that will help you. And what I want primarily to do is to help you to help yourself. It's a real privilege to speak to a group of young people like this. I have said in many places, and I'll say it to you, I believe that a special generation is coming forth in the world, in the United States and elsewhere. And I believe that you people that are here this afternoon are representatives of that generation. Jesus spoke in the Gospels and his prophecies about a certain generation. He said, this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. And he gave various signs and indications of a certain generation at the close of the present age. And I believe we're living in this generation. I believe you're representatives of it. And I believe you have tremendous challenges and privileges and opportunities afforded to you. But at the same time, you have tremendous pressures of evil against you, such as no previous generation of young people has ever had. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 17, you'll find God's purpose for this closing generation. Acts 2, 17. It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. This is the last days, and we are here, this camp is this, because God is pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. All flesh means every section of the human race, every denomination, and every nation. But if you look at that verse, you'll see that the special emphasis is upon the young people. It talks about four groups, sons, daughters, young men, old men. And of those four groups, three are the young ones. Your sons, your daughters, and your young men. There is a tremendous move of the Spirit of God, which is bringing groups such as this together. But at the same time, there is also a tremendous move of God's enemy and our enemy, the devil. And we are living in days when it is almost impossible to avoid coming under the power of some spirit. And the really the only choice we are faced with is which spirit is going to control us. Is it going to be the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, or are we going to open up to the spirits that come from Satan? And I believe that before this age closes, there will hardly be anybody in the earth who is not controlled and motivated either by the Holy Spirit or by the spirits of Satan, evil spirits, demons. There's a passage in Second Timothy that we could look at for a few moments. Second Epistle of Timothy, chapter 3, and just beginning at the first verse, reading a few verses. This know also that in the last days, and that again is the same period that we're talking about, perilous or dangerous times shall come. So we are warned that we are living in perilous or dangerous days. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Does that sound familiar to any of you? unthankful and unholy. Notice three things that go together, being disobedient to parents, being unthankful, and being unholy. They're closely connected. Without natural affection, parents no longer will love their children, children no longer will acknowledge their parents, brothers and sisters will quarrel and hate one another, wives and husbands will break up and almost be as though they've never known one another. That's without natural affection. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, without any kind of control over themselves. Fear despise us of those that are good. How many of you know that in some high schools and other places, if you stand for Jesus Christ, you're despised by the people of Satan? Despise us of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. There's going to be a breakdown of human character, of moral standards at the close of this age. They're going to be acting as if anything goes, anything's committed. They'll throw off restraints. 
and authority and self-control. Isn't this true? Isn't this exactly what we're seeing in modern America? Isn't it an exact description? And you notice it begins and ends with a love of things. Love of pleasure, love of money, and love of self. I doubt whether there ever was an age when people so much loved pleasure, loved money, and loved self as they do today. Then read on just a little bit. In the same chapter of Second Timothy, chapter 3, it says in verse 13, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now where we have in the King James Version seducers, the Greek word is magician. It's people who deliberately practice supernatural, satanic art, magic, fortune telling, the Ouija board, all these things. That's what's covered by the word magician. So at the close of this age, certain things are going to happen. God is going to pour out his Holy Spirit, especially upon the young people. But at the same time, there's going to come a tremendous breakdown of moral and ethical standards, of law and order, standards of discipline and decency and obedience to parents and home life. And Satan is going to move in with supernatural power to captivate the minds of young men and women and boys and girls. Now, all these things are happening all around you. Am I right? Just let me know if I'm telling you the truth. Is that the way it is? Exactly. And now I'm over 50 years old, and I was not too good when I was a young boy. I never knew about Jesus being a savior until I was 25 years old. I went to school, college, and university without any knowledge of salvation. And I was wild and undisciplined, self-pleasing, lawless. I don't need to go into it all. But many of the evils which confront you never confronted me. I was never confronted by drugs. Many forms of magic and black art that are familiar to you never came my way. I was as sad as anybody needs to be. But I did not face the problems that most of you face almost every day because this is a special age. And because it's a special age, God is sending special help by the Holy Spirit. And in this age, you and I are confronted with a decision. Are we going to serve God? Are we going to yield to the Holy Spirit? Are we going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and do the will of God and lead lives that are pure and clean and honor Jesus Christ? Or are we going to yield to the forces of Satan and let Satan invade our lives and take us over by his deceptions and his evil power and his evil practices? That's the decision. Neutrality is ruled out. Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me. And he also said right at the end of the book of Revelation, maybe we could look at that for a moment. Revelation, the last chapter, the 22nd chapter, and the 10th, 11th, and 12th verses, Revelation 22. He said unto me, Feel not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Speaking about a special time, this is the time. He that is unjust or unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still, but it's better translated, let him be still more unrighteous. He which is filthy, let him be still more filthy. He that is righteous, let him be still more righteous. He that is holy, let him be still more holy. Behold, I come quickly. This is the time immediately before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, make up your mind. If you're going to live in sin, live it up. If you're going to be filthy, go on and be still more filthy because you don't have long. But if you're going to be righteous, be still more righteous. If you're going to be holy, be still more holy. It's the parting of the way. Everybody has got to go one way or the other. Now, when Satan seeks to move into the lives of young people and take them over, he works through the inward corruption of our own nature, which is called sin. He exploits the things in us that are evil, the bad desires, the bad tendencies, the weaknesses. But he has one particular type of agent that he uses to take us over, enslave us, and destroy us. And that agent is called in the scripture a demon or an evil spirit. And the whole of the New Testament indicates very clearly that we are brought face to face with the power of demons or evil spirits. And that we are going to succumb to them, be deceived by them, and be taken over by them unless we come to understand who they are and how they work and how to get free from them and how to resist them and overcome them. Now the Bible tells us that we can be free from the dominion of evil spirits, that we can overcome evil spirits that we can cast them out of ourselves and cast them out of other people. But in order to do this, we need to know the way evil spirits operate. Now the Lord has led me into this ministry quite extensively in the last eight years. 
and I have counseled and prayed with hundreds of people who have problems with evil spirits. And I have discovered that in most cases, their problems began in childhood, very early in life. And so it seems to me reasonable that we should try to help people while they're still young and before they've been under this power and dominion and suffered these problems so many years of their lives. Now, I discovered that there are certain things which open children and young people up to the attack of evil spirits. The first and the greatest thing is this. If there is disharmony in a home between the parents, if father and mother do not agree, do not live in harmony, if they quarrel, and even more, if they break up and get divorced, that creates an atmosphere in that home which opens up those children to the attack of evil spirits. And most children do not have sufficient defense to keep those evil spirits out. The majority of people that I pray with for deliverance who are adults, I find that the spirits entered when they were children, and they entered in most cases because there was disharmony, strife, bitterness, quarreling, argument, and sometimes unfaithfulness and divorce between their parents. Now many of you that are here this afternoon have some kind of home background like that. It may be a professing Christian home. Your parents may have called themselves Baptist or Episcopalian. It doesn't matter what religion they call themselves. The question is, do they love one another? Is there harmony? Is there unity? Is there peace? If not, the Bible says, where envy and strife are, there is confusion and every evil work. That's what opens up children to the attack of evil spirits. Now you might say, well, it isn't fair if I get exposed to these evil spirits because my parents don't know how to run the home. It isn't fair, but then the devil isn't fair. Don't expect the devil to be fair because he isn't. Now I have discovered that one of the commonest sources of problems in young people is that they come to a place where they resent their parents, one or both. And I want to be very honest with you, in many cases, children such as you or young people such as you have good reasons to resent your parents. Your parents have not treated you always the way they should. One of the great problems that children have with their father is that the father never gave enough time to the family. He was too busy making money or becoming the president of a bank or at the country club or on the golf course and his children, particularly his sons, never had enough time with him. Now that is the fault of your father. There are also those who have trouble with their mother. Sometimes the mother doesn't take any interest, or at other times she tries to run and dominate and control your life. And either way, you tend to react by resenting your mother, or your father, or both. And after resentment, the next thing that comes is hatred. You actually begin to hate one or both of your parents. And after hatred, the next one that comes is rebellion. And you turn against your parents, you turn against their authority and their discipline, and after a while it goes beyond your parents, you turn against the church, you turn against the school authorities, you turn against the government, you turn against God himself, and you become a rebel. Now this is a pattern of behavior that is found in the lives of countless thousands of young people in the United States. Resentment, hatred, rebellion. Now all these things are demons. There's a demon of resentment, a demon of hatred and a demon of rebellion. And if you open up to these things, sooner or later those spirits will enter into you and take control of you. Now, if you want to be free, you have to undo the thing that opened up the way. You have to repent of the wrong attitude towards your parents. And in most cases, you have to forgive your father or mother or both. The Bible says, honor thy father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee. And it never will be well with you if you do not honor your father and mother. You can go through all of life trying to be a success, trying to find happiness, trying to find fulfillment, but you will never find it if you have a wrong attitude to either or both of your parents. Now this is a law of God. I didn't make it and I can't change it. Law can use it. The only thing we can do about the laws of God is submit to them and obey them. There are many of you that do not have true inward peace because of a wrong attitude towards your parents. Now, I am being very frank with you. Your parents may be in the wrong. Your father may be an alcoholic. 
but he is still your father. You do not honor him as an alcoholic, but you honor him as your father. And if he has been unkind or unreasonable, if he's provoked you, if he's misunderstood you, there's one thing you have to do in order to get true peace. It is forgive your father. Forgive your mother. Sometimes your elder brother, your elder sister. Let me tell you two true stories that illustrate this. A young man came to me about six years ago. He had been saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit and he was planning to marry a girl of his own age who was a Pentecostal girl who was also baptized in the Spirit. But he had this problem. Now when I tell people this, they always laugh. And you're free to laugh, but at the same time it's a real and a serious problem. At times, though he loved this girl and really wanted to marry her, he would get so angry with her that he would almost throttle her. So he went to a psychiatrist. And after a while, I happened to come along and he came to me. And he started to tell me about his problem. And he told me about fixation. And when I heard the word fixation, I said, you've been to a psychiatrist, haven't you? And he said, yes, I have. Well, I said, I'm not saying the psychiatrist is wrong, but I'm telling you that I deal with things in a different way. The psychiatrist talks about a fixation, I talk about a demon. Now, you can decide, do you want it the psychiatrist's way or do you want it my way? He said, I want it your way. Well, I said, in that case, you have to take the steps that are necessary to get these evil spirits out of your life. And I said to him, did you have an unhappy home? And he said, yes. I said, was your father against your mother? And he said, yes. And I said, whose side were you on? He said, my mother's side. And I said, was your father sometimes unkind and brutal to you? He said, yes. Well, I said, one thing I'll tell you, if you want to be free, you have to forgive your father. He said, my father is dead. I said, it makes no matter whether your father is dead or alive. It's not for your father's sake you're forgiving him, it's for your sake. Because until you forgive your father, there's something tied inside you that no one can ever untie. So I instructed him a little bit more and laid him in a prayer. And in this prayer, I led him, as you probably heard me, and I will be doing a prayer like this later in this service, I led him to confess his faith in Jesus Christ, receive the forgiveness of his sins, and then claim deliverance. Now, I meant to make him say in the prayer, I forgive my father, but I forgot. So when I got to the end of the prayer, without my saying anything, spontaneously, he himself said, and I forgive my father. Then I knew that he really was in earnest. Put my hand on him, prayed for him, Two fixations left him, resentment and hatred. But they would never have left until he forgave his father. Another case, I was preaching in a Pentecostal church and uh, at the end of the service about 30 people stayed for different needs and prayers. And there was one teenage girl who looked about as miserable as I've ever seen a teenage girl look. And I've, I've brought up nine girls so I know something about teenage girls. And uh, I went up to her and I said, what's the matter with you? And she said, it's my sister. I said, what's wrong with your sister? She said, she's still mean to me. She makes life mean, wretched for me. I said, is your sister older than you or younger? She said, she's one year older. She's 19. Well, I said, are you willing to forgive your sister? And she kind of looked at me and didn't answer. So I, I thought I'd use a little wisdom, and I don't have too much of that, but I had, I used what I had. And I tried to paint out for her what an intelligent girl she was, how pretty she was, what a good life she could have. And when I got her really listening to that, and most girls will listen to that, <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said it would be a pity to let your sister spoil all that for you, wouldn't it? And she said, yes. So I said, would you like to say a prayer after me? So she said, yes. So I thought, I'll get her praying and then I'll slip in the important word. So I began a kind of good general prayer. And when she was saying each sentence after me, I slipped in, and I forgive my sister. And she said after me, and I forgive... And she couldn't say another word. The Spirit of God fell upon her. She broke up. Things turned loose inside her. She was completely set free. About 15 minutes later, she went out of that church looking the happiest teenage girl I've seen for a long while. It's all... See, it all happened when she said sincerely, I forgive. She didn't even have time to say my sister. So here is one major cause of young people's problems. It's resentment, followed by hatred, followed up by rebellion. And it's usually against your parents, or a brother, or a sister. Sometimes it may be a school teacher, or an aunt, or a grandmother, but it's in that range. And if you want help this afternoon, if you want real liberty, real peace, you're going to have to forgive 
that person or those persons. Now, many people say to me, Brother Prince, I don't feel I can forgive. And my answer is, you don't have to feel it, you have to will it. Forgiveness is not a feeling, it's a decision. And you can make that decision when the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do so. It's like tearing up an IOU. Suppose I've uh, borrowed $10,000 from Dr. Davis down there, who's a friend of mine, I don't know whether he could lend me $10,000, but suppose I have, and I've given him my IOU for $10,000. So there he is, we're sitting together, he's got my IOU in his hand. And it says, I owe you $10,000, Derek Prince. And Dr. Davis says to me, oh, Brother Prince, I really have seen you. You're a wonderful brother in the Lord. I think, so what? He says, Brother Prince, I'm praying for you. I still think, so what? Brother Prince, I love you. I think, so what? Brother Prince, I, I know you didn't mean to get into that. I know you couldn't help. I still think, so what? You know what I'm waiting for? I'm waiting to see what he'll do with the IOU. <laughs> he doesn't have to say anything. The moment he tears that up, I'm free. All his words are not so important as what he does with the IOU. Well, forgiveness is tearing up the IOU. Now, I will acknowledge most of you have an IOU for a lot of love and a lot of care and a lot of understanding that your parents should have given you and didn't give you. I'll agree with you. What are you going to do with the IOU? If you want to be happy, tear it up. It's a decision. All right? Now, that's the root and basis of everything. It's our personal relationship in the family. That's where we begin. We all begin life by being born, and every one of us has a mother. There's no exception. The closest relationship we ever have in life is to our mother. We're actually connected physically to our mother when we're born. A father, brothers and sisters. And later on, you young people, you find there's another problem that comes your way if a husband or a wife. Let's, let's stay clear of that one for the time being, all right? Now then, the other great area of problems with young people is the satanic supernatural. It's supernatural power that does not come from God, but does come from the devil. I want to tell you this. There are only two sources of supernatural power in the world. One is God, the other is the devil. Any supernatural power that does not come from God does come from the devil. Now, man was made to enjoy the supernatural. God never intended us just to live on the level of our natural ability what we can reason and think and do with our minds and our hands. One of the most surprising miracles in the New Testament is Jesus walking on the water. You remember that story? And you remember the disciples were sitting in a boat and they watched Jesus and Peter thought, I'd like to walk on the water. Did you ever recognize that? And he said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus said, come. And Peter stepped out and started walking across the water to Jesus. Then he looked at the waves and got scared and began to sink. And he just had time to say, Lord, save me, and Jesus stretched out his hand and lifted him up. Now, what I want to point out to you is that Jesus said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Jesus did not reprove him for wanting to walk on the water. Jesus reproved him for not having enough faith to do it. Why did Peter want to walk on the water? What's the use of walking on the water? Doesn't feed anybody? Doesn't heal anybody? What's the use of it? Shall I tell you? Because we are made with a desire in us for more than the natural. About two generations in America have tried to live on natural understanding, natural ability. Science, technology, what you can do with machines, what you can do with electronics, what you can do with engines, what you can do with mathematics and arithmetic and logic and philosophy. But your generation has said, we want to get out of the boat. We want to walk on the water. We are not satisfied with technology and cars and showers and baths and swimming pools and everything. There's something more, and we want it. Now, that desire for the supernatural was put in you by God, because he wants you to be filled with his spirit. He wants you to live above the level. He wants you to live in the supernatural. He wants you to have the gifts of the spirit. He wants you to prophesy and preach and pray. But so many young people didn't know how to find the supernatural in God and Jesus Christ, and they started to look elsewhere. Now, I did the same. I went to church as an Anglican for about 20 years, never found any supernatural power in the church, and decided I'd have to look somewhere else for it. And I went to philosophy and oriental cult, yoga, Buddhism, and all sorts of things. And I became a practicing yogi for a short time. I got into the supernatural, but it was the devil's supernatural. And when I later wanted to come to Christ, the greatest barrier between Christ and me 
was not the sins I'd committed, but the fact that my mind was imprisoned and captivated with the teaching of yoga. And it took a divine deliverance to set me free before I could really believe in Jesus Christ. Now, many of you, without fully knowing what you were doing, have got involved in Satan's supernatural. The commonest way amongst young people is the Ouija board. If you were honest, many of you have fooled with the Ouija board. The Ouija board is a form of fortune telling. The Bible calls it divination. And under the law of Moses, anybody that practiced anything like that was put to death. There wouldn't be many people living in some of our high schools if everybody that fooled with the Ouija board was executed, wouldn't it? Well, God doesn't say we put people to death today, but this judgment remains the same. There are other ways that people seek the supernatural. Many seek it by drugs. The desire is good. The way of satisfying it is evil. You get into the supernatural, but it's by the wrong door, and you get into the wrong realm. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you want to come into the presence and power of God and the Holy Spirit, you must come through Jesus Christ. He is the only door. If you take any other way, such as many of you have experimented with, the Ouija board, fortune telling, drugs, music, philosophy, meditation, yoga, charm, and even the specific and deliberate worship of Satan, you have strayed into the devil's territory. Now, there's a proverb in the English language which says this, I don't know whether you know it, he that sucks with the devil must use a spoon with a long handle. But I want to tell you there's no spoon made with a handle long enough. When you sit at the devil's table, you give him your little finger and he's grabbed above your elbow before you even know what's happening. And you are a captive. You see, whatever you go to for supernatural help or power or understanding that is not the true God is a false God. It's a demon. Behind that Ouija board is a demon. Behind those drugs are demons. Behind all sorts of philosophies and cults and meditations and mysteries, there are demons. And when you go that way and open up your mind and your body to these things, you have opened up to the power of demons, evil spirits. They move in and they captivate you. They captivate your mind. One of the commonest demons is confusion. Almost anybody that's been involved in fortune telling or the occult has the spirit of confusion. They cannot think clearly. They cannot always discern between evil and good. This is confusion. Many people that have been in drugs are unable to discern between that which is evil and that which is good. They reach out for good, but it's evil that they grasp. They're confused. Their minds are being perverted. Another very common demon that troubles these people is the demon of perversion, and often it's the sex perversion. They become abnormal in their sex attitudes and practices. All these things are demonic. The Bible lists many of them, and continually I am finding people whose minds are being oppressed and tormented, who are in a state of bondage and fear and confusion and frustration and darkness because they've gone into the wrong supernatural realm. Now, many of you here this afternoon, in one way or another, even though you may be comparatively young, have been involved in these things. It's easier to get in than it is to get out. Satan does not willingly let you go. I have dealt with not a few people that have been involved in seances, in the occult, and in the worship of Satan. And when I challenge Satan's power in them, those demons have spoken out of their throats and said, she's mine, we won't let her go, she belongs to us. They regard those people as their property, they're very reluctant to let you go. And if you're going to come fully free, you've got to know what to do, how to get free. And that's what I'm going to try to tell you now. And then those of you that need to be free, I'm going to instruct you and pray with you that you may be set free. Now we've dealt with the problem, now let's deal with the solution. And these are the things that I say that a person has to do. I've arrived at these rules by experience, and I've discovered that God doesn't change his rules. A lot of people would like to get God just to make an exception for them, but he doesn't do it. And I can't get God to change his rules. It's not my business. All I can do is tell you God's rules. And after that, it's up to you whether you obey God's rules and meet his conditions or not. I pray you will, for your own sake. 
These are the conditions. First of all, you've got to be humble. You've got to lay aside pride. You've got to be willing to acknowledge that you need help. Now, you may figure yourself out to be very intellectual, very smart, very clever, and have all the answers. But I'll tell you one person that's a lot smarter than you, that's the devil. And when you get involved with the devil, you're going to need more help than you can give yourself. You're going to need supernatural help from God to get free. The second thing you've got to do is to be absolutely honest. Don't try to cover anything up. Don't try to call it by the wrong name. Don't try to excuse it. Say, God, it's true. I did that thing. I have that attitude. I do hate my father. I know it's wrong, but I do, God. I'm not trying to cover it up from you. I'm honest with you. God blesses us when we become honest with God. There's a moment when you have to level with God. The third thing you have to do is confess your sins. Whatever you've done wrong, that the Holy Spirit brings to you, whatever is tormenting your mind and giving you a feeling of guilt, confess it to God. Tell God. Now, I've got wonderful news for you. A lot of people are scared to confess to God because they think that God doesn't know what they're going to tell him. But in actual fact, no, no matter what you tell God, he knows it all already. You're not telling God anything he doesn't know. And I'll tell you something else that's wonderful. God is unshockable. You cannot stop him. I know many of you have done and said and thought things you would be ashamed to tell your parents. But remember, God will not be shocked. He won't turn you away. He won't hold it against you. The reason why he demands that you confess it is not for his sake, but for yours. Because when you confess it, you're on the way out of it. The fourth thing that you have to do is repent. Now this is so important. Few people really understand what repentance is. Repentance, like forgiveness, is a decision. You make up your mind. The devil has had enough of me in my life. I fooled around with sin and with the things of the devil long enough. Now I'm going to stop. Right now. I'm going to turn away from everything that is evil and unpleasing to God. I'm going to face God, be honest with God, and submit to God. I'm not going to be a rebel any longer. That's repentance. And when you've been involved in things like the Ouija board or fortune telling or all these things, you have to renounce those things specifically. You say, I'll burn my Ouija board, I'll throw away my charms, I'll throw my drugs down the toilet. Whatever it may be, I'll get rid of that thing that gave Satan power in my life. You cannot hold on to those things and be free. You've got to get rid of the very thing that is the emblem of Satan and his power in your life. The fifth thing you have to do is forgive other people. I've spoken about that. If you don't forgive others, God doesn't forgive you. If you're not forgiven, then the devil has rights in your life. And as long as the devil has got a claim over you, he's going to insist on it. In order to get free, you must freely forgive every other person. It's not bad to make a little list of the people that you need to forgive. And when the time comes in this service, I'm going to give you a few moments to mention by name the people that you specifically know you need to forgive. My father, my mother, my brother, my teacher, Jimmy, Sally, Sue, whoever it may be. The more specific you are, the better it works. All right. These are the five things you have to do. Shall we go through them again? You've got to be humble. You've got to be honest. You've got to confess your sins to God. You've got to repent, turn away, renounce, turn your back on sin and turn your face toward God. You've got to get out of your life the things that mark Satan and his control. You know, let me just give you an example of this. Let me say the fifth thing you've got to forgive. With regard to the power of things to bind you, let me tell you this true story that happened in Fort Lauderdale. Some of you have seen us pray for people for their legs to grow out. How many of you have seen that? All right. Praise God, that's a lot. And you know it's real. Well, a friend of mine was watching one young man pray for another young man in a meeting. And the young man had one leg that was an inch shorter than the other. Now, several people had had their legs grow out, but when this young man prayed for the other young man, his leg did not grow. My friend standing there noticed that the young man had a kind of bracelet around his ankle. You know what I'm talking about? So after a while he said, now, what's that bracelet? And the young man said, I don't know. He said, does it mean anything to you? He said, no. He said, my girlfriend gave it to me. Well, he said, do you think it meant anything to your girlfriend? The young man said, I don't know. He said, do you think that to your girlfriend that bracelet meant rebellion? He said, it could be. He said, would you be willing to take that bracelet off? The young man reached down, took it off, his leg grew out. <laughs> there can be a power in a thing. If that thing means Satan in any way, 
You better turn it off. You may have a ring. I prayed for another girl. She was possessed. She was violent. She was screaming. She was trying to claw my eyes up. Somebody noticed she had a ring of a snake on her finger. Took the ring off. Deliverance came easily. See, you cannot afford to retain anything in your life for property or home that identifies you and associates you with the devil. If you want to belong to God, you've got to sever connection with the devil. You cannot be in both camps at the same time. You've got to make a clean break. Some of you girls may be associating with boys who are unsane. Listen, that is not the way to get a young man saved. You know? I'm reminded of a little story I once heard of a young woman who came to her pastor and said to the pastor, Pastor, this is the young man I want to marry. So the pastor said, Oh, is he a Christian? The girl said, No, but he will be after we're married. He's going to become a Christian. So the pastor said to the young lady, Would you do something for me? She said, What is it? He said, Would you get up on that table and stand on that table for a moment? So she did. Now he said, Give your hand to the young man, and the young man was standing on the floor. And she did. The pastor said, Now, you try and pull the young man up onto the table. And then he said to the young man, You try and pull the girl down onto the floor. Which do you think won? And that's how it'll be if you marry an unsaved man to make him a Christian. It does not work. If you're going around and associated with and emotionally entangled with an unsaved person, that can be the channel of Satan into your life. There's plenty of fine young Christian men and women. Don't pick a lemon. <laughs> Okay. When you've met the conditions, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. You know whosoever means? It means you. Anybody in this room here. Now let me tell you three simple things about actually receiving deliverance and then we're going into it. Number one, there is only one deliverer and his name is Jesus. That's right. It's not Brother Frank, nor Brother Mumford, nor Brother Wallace, nor anybody else. If you want deliverance, you must come to the deliverer, Jesus. Direct. Now Jesus said, Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. So if you come, he will not turn you away. That's point number one. Point number two, deliverance is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you want deliverance, when you come to Jesus, you must yield to the Holy Spirit. Don't fight the Holy Spirit because you're finding deliverance. Number three, you can cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Now let me explain this. This is the hardest thing for some people to understand. I'll just understand it quickly. In Philip's translation of Mark 16, 17, it says this. These signs will follow them that believe. In my name they shall expel demons. Now the word expel is a key word because it shows you what to do. If you had been smoking and you had inhaled tobacco smoke into your lungs and you didn't want it there, what would you do? You'd expel it. What's that? It's a decision of your will and an action of your muscles. You breathe it out. Now that's how you get rid of evil spirits. An evil spirit is a breath. The word spirit and breath in the Bible are the same. When you have come to Jesus, when you have called upon his name, when the Holy Spirit has come to your help, cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Expel that thing. Take it. Put it out. I've often said this, the devil is no gentleman. He comes in uninvited and you usually have to kick him out. Don't treat him like a gentleman. Get real mad with him. Expel him. Take a deep breath. Breathe it out. The first breath, it may be just your breath. Second breath, just your breath. But if you go on, there'll be something more than your breath coming out. That's what you want to get rid of. If you can grasp that, if you can meet those conditions, if you can really turn against the devil, and then expel him, you don't need a lot of struggling. Struggling comes when people are divided in their mind and will and they're not quite sure whether they want the devil out or not. The person that really makes up his mind, I am not going to have the devil any longer, and I'm a child of God and I'm using the name of Jesus, that thing has to go. I don't say he won't kick around a little, he may scream, he may shout, but he will have to go. Listen, no child of God needs to be afraid of the devil. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You don't have to flee from him. That understood? Okay. Well, now what we're going to do is do it. I'd like everybody quietly to bow in prayer. Just a moment. Everybody, all over this congregation. 
Now, please, just a moment of quietness. Then if you're not at rest here, you can leave. How many other of you young people would say, Brother Prince, I realize there's something in my life that shouldn't be there and I want to get rid of it the way you say it. Would you put your hands? My, 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 look at that. Goodness me. Well, God bless you. appreciate that. Thank you. Now, any of you that don't want to stay, you can move out from now on at any time. But those of you that raised your hands, I want you just to stand in your place where you are. Just stand up right now in your place. Now, don't be ashamed and don't be embarrassed. If there's anything there that you don't want there, this is the best opportunity you're likely to have to get rid of it. Now, I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm going to read you in a prayer. And I want you to say this prayer out loud after me. And when you finish praying, then I want you to expel those spirits. Don't go on praying. I'll do the praying from then on. You do the letting go. See? That's what I tell you. I'll command those spirits to come out. You push them up. Okay? And don't be afraid. You don't need to be afraid of the devil. As a matter of fact, the devil is afraid of you. That's wonderful news. And when you've made things inside so good for Jesus, the devil doesn't want to stay there. He's keen to get out. All right, now you say these words. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, and that you rose again from the dead. I am sorry for all my sins. I repent of all my sins. I repent of every contact with Satan, of every evil thing that I have allowed into my life. I renounce all these evil things. Now you put in the thing, whatever it is. I renounce. Now you say the Ouija board, fortune telling, whatever it is. Say it. Be specific. Say it by name. Yoga, ESP, any of these things. Hypnotism, automatic writing, whatever it is. Say it. I renounce. All right, now we come to forgiveness. And Lord, I also forgive all others who have wronged me or harmed me. I lay down all resentment, all hatred, and all rebellion. In particular, Lord, I forgive, now put in the person, my father, my mother, whoever it may be, society, the church, the Jews, the Germans, the white people, the colored people, whatever it might be, I forgive. Okay, be sure. I forgive. All right, now we go on praying. And Lord, I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me in your blood. And I believe that you do this now. I accept your forgiveness. And I accept your cleansing. I accept your love. And I forgive myself. And now, Lord, I renounce those evil spirits. Anything inside me that ought not to be there, I renounce it now. I loose myself from it. And in the name of Jesus, I command it to leave me. Amen. Now let them go. Satan, I come against you. In the name of Jesus, I bind your power in this auditorium and I will all of us associate with his young people. And I command those spirits to look and come out of his young people in the name of Jesus. Satan, come out in Jesus' name. Come out in the name of Jesus. Come out in the name of Jesus. Elder well, Tennessee, Georgia, CFO Camp in Eatonton, Georgia, on the Thursday evening, August the 26th, 1971, uh, by Brother uh, Derek Prince. I've never been in a service exactly like this before. I have no exact blueprint of what to do. But I'm just trusting that the Holy Spirit will help us all. The important thing for us all to remember, boy or girl, father or mother, is that God loves us. And no matter how weak we may be and how foolish we may be, 
He really wants to help us, if we'll only let him do it. First of all, I think I should speak to the parents, then maybe to the children. Now, as I understand the scripture, God has ordained the family and set a certain order in the family. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the man or the husband. The man is the head of the woman. And then father and mother together are over the children. This is the divine order. And when the divine order is set aside, then problems begin. There really isn't such a thing as problem children. The only thing we have is problem parents. Many times people bring what is called a problem child to me. And I always say problem child, problem parent. And I have never yet found it otherwise. Uh, a rather comical thing happened a couple of years ago in Florida. Two ladies, each the mother of a boy as well as other children, and each boy was about 11 years old, kept phoning me and saying, Brother Prince, do pray for my boy. He needs deliverance. So I said in the end, I'm going to be at a certain prayer meeting in a certain home on a certain night. If you like to bring your boy there, we'll see what will happen. So each of the mothers turned up, each with a sulky, rebellious, unwilling boy of about 11 years old. And I preach nothing to do with boys at all. I don't recall what I preach, but each of the mothers came under conviction. And at the end of my message, the two mothers began to call upon God and confess their own wrongdoing, their own wrong attitude. And one of them in particular confessed that she was always complaining about her children and said, Lord, forgive me this complaining spirit. She broke down, began to sob, and her little boy got so upset about his mother sobbing that he started to sob. And when the mother got delivered, the boy got delivered without anybody praying for him. Really, the key is always in the parent. And um, for me, as a stranger and a preacher and someone from outside to minister to your children, is very difficult, because you cannot help any person unless that person has confidence in you. And for me to have the confidence of your children after talking to them for half an hour will be a miracle. Probably the best thing that I can do is tell you how to do it for yourself and for your children. However, we'll see how we get along. The first thing for children and parents alike is salvation. <laughs> to know that you're saved. To know that your sins are forgiven to know that God is your Father, that if you, that you have a home in heaven, and if you die, you're not going to hell, you're going to heaven. Many parents come to me and they say, pray for my child, I say, is the child saved? I, say, I don't know. Or I say, why don't you know? Whose business is it to know? How old is the child? Six or seven? Listen, when a child is old enough to be naughty and know it, a child is old enough to be saved. If a child can be naughty and repent and ask its parents for forgiveness, that child can repent and ask God for forgiveness. And basically it is the responsibility of parents and primarily of the father to instruct his children in the truth of the gospel and salvation. And God has never transmitted that responsibility to anybody else, not to a Sunday school teacher or a youth leader or a pastor. Every parent is responsible for the spiritual instruction and discipline of his own children. And if parents accepted this responsibility, then we wouldn't have the problem children that we have. Another thing that I want to tell you is that children are often capable of advanced spiritual understanding at an early age. Spiritual understanding doesn't go exactly with natural age. There's a parent here tonight, I was talking to him the other day, and he will know what I'm talking about. He and his wife came to me for counseling with my wife, and they brought their little boy who was about, what, four or five years old at the time? And they said, of course, he won't understand. So I said, how do you know he won't understand? So I talked to them about deliverance and evil spirits as best I could for about half an hour. And when they got up to go, the little boy said, I see. If you want the right spirit in, you breathe it in. And if you want the wrong spirit out, you breathe it out. <laughs> and I said, you see, he saw much better than you did. <laughs> well, that's how simple it is. If you want the right spirit in, you breathe it in. And if you want the wrong spirit out, you breathe it out. But first of all, you've got to meet God's condition. Now, the Bible teaches, and I'm talking to you children now, that we're all sinners. We've all done wrong. We've all done things we shouldn't have done. Bad things. How many of you believe that's true? All right. 
Now, the Bible teaches that God loves us, and he doesn't want to punish us for what we've done. So God made another way. He sent Jesus, his only begotten Son, into the world, and Jesus took all our sins upon him, your sins and my sins, died in our place on the cross, and all the punishment that was due to you and me came upon Jesus. He was punished for our sins. He took our sin upon him. He died our death. He died in our place. And then he rose again from the dead, and he's alive now, and at the right hand of Almighty God. And if any of us has committed anything that's wrong or bad, and we are truly sorry for what we have done, and we believe in Jesus and what he did for us, and we come to him and ask him to forgive us, God has promised for sure that he will forgive us and that he will cleanse away all our sins through the blood of Jesus. This is God's written guarantee. No matter how many wrong things you may have done, no matter how bad you may feel, if you will turn away from the bad things you've done and be sorry for them and decide you don't want to go on doing them any longer, and then will come to God and tell God that you believe that Jesus died in your place, and you're sorry, and you ask God to forgive you for Jesus' sake, God has committed himself, he's promised in his word that he will forgive you, and that he will cleanse your heart in the blood of Jesus. The Bible says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white, whiter than snow. So there is a way to be forgiven and to be clean no matter how many bad things you have done. Sooner or later in life, every one of us has to choose. Do I want to belong to God and Jesus Christ, or do I want to belong to the devil? And in the end, that's the only choice we have. Belong to God, belong to the devil. Now, Jesus says the devil is a thief. He's not a gentleman. You know what a thief does? He comes in when you don't know it. He comes in in the dark. Maybe he forces his way in, or maybe he climbs in through a window, or maybe he comes to the door and pretends that he wants to read the gas, and really he's a thief and walks in and takes something to go. You don't know how a thief is coming. You don't know when he's coming. Many times you don't see him come. He hides himself. Now, Jesus says the devil is like that. And the truth of the matter is, many of you little boys and girls, the devil has come to you and maybe you didn't know it. Now, the devil is a spirit, and you just don't see him with your eyes like you can see your father and mother or me. He's invisible, and he has a lot of bad spirits that work for him and do his dirty jobs for him. And his aim is to get his bad spirits inside you and me. Now, when I look back on my own life, and I'm older than some of you, I won't even tell you how much older, I realized that by the time I was nine years old, the devil had got a lot of his bad spirit into me. Now, I didn't know what they were. I'll tell you something. I was a little bit of a lonely child. I had no brothers or sisters. I was quite clever with my brain. I was always good at class. Could do my lessons, get good grades. And I got a little bit shut off from other people, and I would spend hours talking to myself. Do you ever do that? And I would always talk to myself in the floor, shall we do this, shall we do that, shall we go here? And I realized many years later, that was bad spirit in me, talking to one another. There was a kind of parliament going on inside me. I had bad spirits in me from the age of two. I was born in India. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. And my mother and my father were good people, but they didn't have much time for me. And so my mother handed me over to an Indian woman, they called him an ayah in India. And this woman was a Hindu, she wasn't Christian. And I had much more to do with this woman when I was a little baby than with my mother or son. Now the Hindus in India, they worship devils, idols. And the whole of India is just full of demons. And there's no doubt in my mind that before I was two years old, that woman had got a lot of those Indian demons into me. You say it isn't fair, but the devil isn't fair. See? Now, one of my big problems in life has always been getting angry, because none of you ever have that problem, do you? <laughs> and I wrestled with this for years. And then when I became a Christian, after a while, God showed me when this problem started. 
And in a way that only God can do, he took me back in my mind, step by step, right to the time when I was a very small boy. I was two years old, and I was sitting at a table in the dining room of our home in India, eating a melon. Now, for some strange reason, my father, and he was really a good man in many ways, thought it was a good thing to tease the little boy. See? I think he thought we ought to get tough young, you know? <coughs> and so, one, this time, he deliberately teased me. And he said something to me to distract my attention, turn me away, and when I wasn't looking, he took my melon. Well, I turned round and my melon wasn't there, and I got violently angry. And in those days, I could speak Hindustani just as well as I could speak English. And I got mad with all the Indian servants and scolded them in Hindustani. But they hadn't taken my name. Now, the whole family always remember that incident because of the way I scolded the Indian servants. You see? But when I looked back, I realized that at that moment, the demon of anger entered me. And from then on, one of the pressures in my life was anger. Now, I'm telling you things I don't often tell in public because I hope it'll help you. From then on, I'm sure other spirits entered, and I'm not going to tell you all of them. But when I was about 12 years old, I was at a boarding school in England, and I was playing with a football, and another boy took the football from me. You've never had that happen, I'm sure. And I got so angry with that boy, they had to hold my arms down. I would have killed him if I could. And you know the demon that entered then? Murder. Now, I've never murdered anybody, thank God. But the Bible says, if you hate your brother in your heart, you are a murderer already. So I know from personal experience, also from helping many others, that little boys and girls, two and three and upwards, especially if their parents are not good Christians, can easily have these bad spirits under them. Now, your parents may be Christians, they may be Baptists. But try telling something about Baptists. <laughs> They sometimes quarrel and fight amongst themselves. Did you know that? And if our parents quarrel and fight, something comes into that home which makes the evil spirits feel welcome. And there's nothing that attracts evil spirits so quickly as parents quarreling and arguing and fighting with one another. Though they may be good Baptists or Roman Catholics, doesn't make any difference. And those parents don't know it, but they're exposing their children to these bad spirits. And one after another, these bad spirits will come in like thieves. You won't know exactly when they came or how they came or even what they are. But it'll pattern in your life that things will begin to happen to you that you can't control. Some of you know what it is, without any good reason, to get so mad that you don't know what to do about it, don't you? Hmm? Well, if you tell the truth, the answer is yes. You get mad with your mother, mad with your brother, mad with your sister. All right. There's another problem that many small children have. It's fear. How many of you are afraid of the dark? You don't need to put your hand up. Well, why should you be afraid of the dark? Now, all of us feel fear sometimes. But when fear gets a grip on us and drives us and torments us, that's not just me, that's the spirit. And the Bible calls it the spirit of fear. Now, that was one of the many spirits that entered me. I'll tell you how it entered me. Again, my father was responsible. My father's dead now, and I'm not speaking evil of him, but when I was about 13 years old, my father was one of these people who liked detective stories. Hmm? I can't see any good in detective stories myself, but anyhow. He also liked thrillers. And one day, he took the family, including me, to see a play about a man who was called the gorilla. Because instead of one hand, he had a gorilla's paw. And he kills people with his gorilla's paw. I can't believe how intelligent people can go and watch things like that, but they do. And this man had a long green cloak that he put on and a long green hood that he put over his face. And I sat there reluctantly and watched this thing and didn't like it. Got home that night and went to bed, and you know what there was in my bedroom? Long green curtains hanging by the window. I wasn't many minutes before I could see the gorilla in those curtains. And I started to scream and cry, and I got out of bed and rushed upstairs to my parents' room. And my poor father, he had to get out of bed and sleep in my bed. And that happened many nights. It taught him a lesson. He didn't have a good night's sleep for weeks. <laughs> but something got into me. What was it? Spirit of fear. I have a good friend. Some of you have heard of him, Don Basson. Some of you know him. He was listening to a tape that I preached about the spirit of fear and about how evil spirits enter people. And in this tape, I said that in many cases, 
the spirit of fear will enter a child when he's watching something on TV, a horror film, or dark shadow, or something like that. The impact of that thing is too strong for that child's defenses. Now, John Batson is a good friend of mine. He was listening because he's writing a book on these things. And as I began to speak this, he realized that he had in him the spirit of fear. And God showed him how it entered. When he was a boy of about ten, his elder brother took him to a movie. Now, it was supposed to be a good cowboy Indian movie, but his brother didn't want to go to that, so he went to another, which was a horror film. And Don had to sit there through that film because he couldn't go out without his brother, and his brother wouldn't go out. And he said, I just cowered there and tried to close my eyes and shut this thing out, but I couldn't keep it out. And he said, from then onward, there was always a certain kind of fear in my life that controlled me in certain ways. And it was only when he heard this tape of mine that he fully realized what his problem was and called on the name of Jesus and was delivered from that spirit of fear. Well, he was over 40 years old when that happened. So he must have had that thing in him for over 30 years. Now, many of us have these things in us, but we don't really know what they are or exactly how they work. The wonderful thing about the Bible is that it tells us what these things are and how to get rid of them. Let me tell you one more type of thing, and I'm only mentioning a few, that is very common today and that is trying to get a, a kind of kick out of fooling around with things we're not supposed to fool around with, such as a Ouija board. How many of you know what a Ouija board is? Yeah, well, I won't even ask how many of you have played with a Ouija board. But playing with a Ouija board is going to the devil to get to know things that you shouldn't ask from the devil. You should never go to the devil for help. And when you start to play with a thing like a Ouija board, or you get somebody to read your palm, or you get somebody to tell your fortune out of the teacup, or you do any of these things like that, or you start to study the horoscope to find out what's going to happen to you each week, you are playing with the things of the devil. And when you start to play with the things of the devil, you get into trouble. Now, there is a proverb in English, I don't know whether you've ever heard it, it says, he that eats supper with the devil must use a spoon with a long handle. But I tell you tonight, there's no spoon with a handle long enough to make it safe to eat with the devil. And you give the devil your little thing during before you turn around, he's grabbed above your elbow and he's got you. And lots and lots of boys and girls in the United States today are being grabbed by the devil through the Ouija board. I was in New Zealand, which is a place where they don't have so much of this thing. I was preaching and praying for people in the Ouija board. Quite a young girl came up and was having a most terrible time getting delivered. And I went to her and I said, whatever did you do to get you into this condition? And she said, in our school, some of the girls decided that we'd ask the spirits to come. And we had a time when we sat and waited for the spirits to come. And she said, something came into me that I can't get out of me. Now, I know that happens in many grade schools in America. I told to parents and children to whom it has happened. And if that happens, you've got something bad in you, a bad spirit that shouldn't be there. Or some of you have been to churches or other places where they don't preach the truth about Jesus. There are some churches which are called churches that they don't truth teach the truth about Jesus. They don't teach that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins and shed his blood and rose again from the dead. And some of you, just through going to places like that and listening to teaching like that, have let a little thief slip into you. Shall I tell you some of the churches that I mean? Well, first of all, spiritual churches, spiritual, unity churches, Christian science churches, Unitarian churches. Though they're called churches, what they teach about Jesus is not true. And behind every lie about Jesus is a nasty, dirty, little lying demon. And if you listen, he'll slip in. Now, I'm not telling you all this to scare you, but I'm telling you this because I want to help you. Now, some of you, as I, sit and, as I stand and talk to you and you sit and listen, you begin to realize there's something in you there shouldn't be. Some of you, you feel your heart beginning to pound a bit faster right now, is that right? Some of you have got a kind of turning feeling in your stomach. Why? Because the thing I'm talking about is right inside you there. All right? Now, I'm going to tell you how to get rid of it. First of all, you've got to come to Jesus. And you've got to tell Jesus that you're sorry for all your sins, anything bad you've done. And you've got to ask Jesus to forgive you 
and cleanse you in his blood and drive any of these bad spirits out of you. And then if you really trust Jesus and we pray together, he'll drive them out of you. But listen, there are certain things particularly that children have to do. One is you have to get right with your parents. The Bible says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you. And if you don't honor your father and mother, it won't be well with you. Now you might say, my father and mother haven't always treated me right. I'll agree. I won't argue. But you still have to honor them. You still have to submit to them. If you feel mad and bitter against your parents, father or mother, Jesus won't deliver you from those bad things. So you just have to make up your mind. You might say, well, my mother didn't treat me right. I'm mad at her. Well, you just have to make up your mind. Is it worthwhile going on being mad at your mother and having the bad spirit in her? I could have said the same about my father. He didn't treat me right. It was partly his fault that these things ended me. So what good would that do me? I want to get rid of them. Don't you? Do you or don't you? You do. All right. Then you've got to say, God, I'm sorry that I haven't treated my mother and father right. And you've got to make up your mind from now on that you will obey and listen to your father and mother. That you'll be obedient, respectful, and tell the truth. If you don't make up your mind about that, I don't believe Jesus will really help you. All right, now I'm going to try and show you how you can get help. First of all, you must feel that you need help. How many of you boys and girls that are 11 years old or under would agree with me that this past week you haven't just been exactly as good as you want to be? Would you agree on that? Is that true? Are you sure? Well, you don't have to say it to please me. Maybe you've said and done bad things. You've said things that weren't true. You've been sassy to your parents. Okay? No, you need Jesus to forgive you. Is that right? If you tell him what you've done wrong, ask him to forgive you, he'll do it. Then, you've got to say, now on, from now on, Jesus, I mean to obey my parents. I mean to be as good as I can in my home. And I want you to drive out of me, by your spirit, any of these nasty, bad, dirty spirits that have got into me. Okay? And if you really mean it and ask Jesus to do it, he'll do it. Now, when you've prayed that prayer, and we're going to pray together in a little while, then remember what the little boy said. He said, if you want the wrong spirit out, you breathe it out. Just don't sit there and just hope something will happen. Start to kick the old devil out. Uh, let me tell you one story which has happened just recently. It happened, as a matter of fact, in Arlington. A mother came with a little boy of about nine and said, Would you pray for my boy? I said, What's the matter for, with him? She said, He has allergy. How many of you know what allergy is? Everybody knows what allergy means now. At least they know what the word is. <laughs> and that's about as much as they know. <laughs> All right. I said, What kind of allergy does he have? She said, Food allergy. He can't eat most kinds of food. So I said to the little boy, do you believe in Jesus? He said, I do. I said, do you believe Jesus can help you? And he said, I do. So I said to the little boy, will you say this? Jesus took my sicknesses and bore my pain, and with his wounds I'm healed. And he said it. I said, now tell that bad spirit to go. And he said, you evil spirit, go in the name of Jesus. Then I said, now blow it out. And he opened his mouth and he, <coughs> like that, about three times. I looked at him and I said, do you believe you're healed? He said, yes, I do. So I sent him off with his mother. About three days later, his mother came back and said, would you pray for me? I said, what's the matter? She said, allergies. I said, why do you want me to pray for you? Because my son is healed. She said. When we went home that day after you prayed with him, he went to the refrigerator and he insisted on sampling every kind of food inside the refrigerator. And he said, she said, normally he would have been very sick. And he was perfectly well. We took him to the doctor. The doctor said there's nothing wrong with him. Why I tell you that story is because that boy had the sense to kick the devil out. See? He blew him out. See that? Sounds silly. But it works. All right. Now, those of you that are going to have the sense to do what I tell you, you get the result. Okay? Now, parents, if you're sitting with your children and you have faith, when your children say the prayer, after they've said it, you encourage them. 
to get those bad spirits on. If you're a believer, you put your hand on them and pray and command those bad spirits to go. All right? And parents, if you have a few bad spirits in you, why not get rid of them at the same time? All right. Now just try and be quiet and rest for a little while, please, if you can. Try and sit still because I warn you, the old devil doesn't want to get picked out and he's going to try and stir up a lot of trouble just now. He's going to make you think of all sorts of different things to get your mind off what we're going to talk about. Now those of you boys and girls that want Jesus to help you, I want you to say these words after me. You don't need to shout them, but say them out loud enough to hear yourself say them. I want you to say these words, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, and that you rose again from the dead. I'm sorry for the bad things I have done. I don't want to do them anymore. And I come to you now, Jesus, and I ask you to forgive me and to wash my heart in your precious blood. Also, Jesus, I want to be good in my home and to obey my parents. Now, please forgive me. Take away my sin and take out of me any bad spirit that ought not to be there. I don't want them any longer. I only want the good spirit that comes from you, Jesus. Amen. All right, now then, I'm going to pray. Tell those spirits to leave. You let them go. Okay? You forget about other people and get rid of those bad spirits. Satan, in the name of Jesus, I bind your power in this place and over these children, and I command you spirits that have tormented these children to come out of them now. In the name of Jesus, every evil spirit that's tormenting any child in this place, I command you to come out of those children in the name of Jesus. Now you get serious, children. You just be determined that anything bad in you that shouldn't be there is going to come out. In Jesus' name, say. And you parents, be willing to come and help your children. The workers, if you want to come now, you come. In the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, you spirit of rebellion, come out of that little girl, in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you, Jesus. I praise your name, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.